performance usually begins with an email. It's from someone who tells you that they like what you do, that they would like to work with you. They would love to work with you. It would be really great to work with you. On occasion, it begins with a phone call, out of the blue, completely unexpected. I once accepted an invite while cycling. It made me feel good about myself, like a talented Frenchman being offered a promotion on holiday. They want a performance, and sometimes they give you a title to work to. Where does performance begin and end? Or voicing the form? Or body tropes? <laughs> a few years ago, I was invited to perform at a group show opening and was surprised to see that my estate agents were going to be exhibiting with me. I then realized it was one of those stupid artist duos who only use their surnames. Denny and Snook, Hopkins and Bosch, Higgins and Piggins. Would I be foolish to imagine that these artists seek each other out? in the same way that solicitors searching for partners with quirky names do. Nobody wants to team up with me because of my boring surname. I'm always a little envious of the safety that being in a duo provides, someone to lean on. A problem shared is indeed a problem halved, and two minds are surely greater than one. But never forget that an artist fee shared is also an artist fee halved. <laughs> that must really rankle and rankle. When I perform, I always choose a costume that I would feel comfortable wearing if I have to make an escape in the catastrophic event of a bomb blast or an earthquake, an outfit that I would be happy to be rescued in. Those souls who perform naked and covered in paint <laughs> run the risk of being found by a fireman or a policeman or even an earthquake dog <laughs> under the rubble naked and covered in paint. <laughs> and though it may well be that the dust from the explosion sticking to the performer's body might look quite good, <laughs> the friend who came along to document the performance has probably perished, crushed under the rubble or overcome by fumes. He won't have got any shots of you that you can use. <laughs> Statistically, a number of you in the audience will dislike me and what I'm doing now. <laughs> Much like the man in Camden Art Center with a collapsed face, sitting cross-legged on the floor with two drawing pins in one of his soft shoes and a single drawing pin in the sole of the other, scowling at my every move. If only I could have his fingernails fall out in his sleep and then force him to pull the drawing pins out of his soles with his nibless digits. <laughs> Not forgetting the serious-minded among every audience, hating me quietly and cleverly whilst I put myself through my paces. I never want to show my bottom to people that may grow to dislike me. <laughs> it's often the case that the performer must get changed in a gallery office. 
I like to keep my outfit there beforehand so that my transformation is as worry-free as possible. Gagging on the smell of coffee, computers, and curator musk, I stow my wallet and mobile phone in my shoes for fear they will be stolen. There is no reason to think that theft cannot happen in an art gallery. I have my quick nosy around the office, post-it notes with exotic artists' names and phone numbers, the elastic bands in a jar, a Polaroid of the curator with an artist they really clicked with and still keep in touch with. That's when the uncertainty starts and your host sticks their head around the door and asks if you're nervous and if they can get you a beer or something. I'm fine, thanks. I seldom have to share this changing room with another. Like boxers, performance artists try to destroy their opponent's confidence beforehand. They will do this by eating a stuffed vine leaf or a fig, or any number of look-at-me foods, <laughs> and then offer one to you with oily fingers. <laughs> no, thank you. <laughs> Friendly, then aloof. London, then nice. They mean to destroy you. They are going to go out there to scream and holler and paint their feet blue. But before they do, while they get into the zone, they will prey on you for fun. Although I lie at night awake, worrying about my performance, agonizing over details, I take secret pleasure in watching artists have problems with incompatible video players at the last <laughs> minute. <laughs> Staring at a blinking LED for an answer. Keystoning, sound bleed, and leaky blackouts. Trials all. In Amsterdam, I saw a Swiss-American artist in tears because of a broken projector, or beamer, as she called it. <laughs> as a gesture of international support, I asked, can I get you a coffee or something? I can't think of such things right now, she replied. I saw a bald man repeat that nasty mantra, cunt, 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 as he tried to repair a broken theremin before a musical performance. A decaffeinated weekender Brian Eno, whose kids hate him. <laughs> so, my own fears of a bad performance or a bad response terrify me. Frightening thoughts hurtle through my mind all at once before I start. A walking stick floating upright above an invalid's bed. A pincushion in the style of a Victorian lady's shoe made out of metal for a Victorian woman with a child-sized foot being used as some kind of toffee hammer to smash my bottom teeth. The sound of teachers scraping their yogurt pots clean in a staff room. <laughs> Walking down a bend in the stairs and coming to a door, and behind the door an old woman, her breath like a gluey vapor, glue dripping out of her mouth, yoo-hoo. Yoo-hoo, she shouts. <laughs> Tooting back Lido in the darkness, a ghostly swimming gala. The swimming trunks they are wearing should tell you that these are pre-war people. Imagine being there now, corpse feet kicking your head as you drift in and out of your lane. <laughs> a story someone told me once about a school with a swimming pool concealed under the assembly hall. I dreamt of those children collapsing through the floor 
with their lunch and drowning with coleslaw floating around them. They would hear the shrieks of the dinner ladies from the county. A swimming pool at night is indeed a troubling thought. Ages old poo poo. Ages old dog poo poo. A middle aged woman chewing treacle toffee. And when those slabs of toffee become chewy enough, letting them fall into your mouth one after another. And she's laughing. She's laughing through her nose as she piles more and more of these black slabs into her mouth. A window cleaner. His tapered ladder constantly wet like a ship's prow. An aluminium-coloured Joe Camel with pissy steel breath, staring at me through my bedroom window, disappearing behind a curtain of grimy suds, and then swiping himself back into view with his squeegee before disappearing once again. A friend's discarded bath towel falls to the bathroom floor and forms a face. A flannel floor gargoyle that you must kill before taking a shower. On a residency with five others in a minibus, heading back after a day when the brakes fail on a mountain pass. Londoners who quit the city at Christmas look forward to leaving the city and chilling out with their families, seeing old friends, not knowing that they spoil everything for everyone else. <laughs> no alls, trying to get the most unusual presents. I don't watch much television, etc., etc. Too busy, blah, blah. Quietly critical of everything and everyone, like rude astronauts returning to Earth. I dreamt I was in a beer garden with friends. Two children, two brothers come and sit down with a large lasagna in an earthenware dish. Whilst the eldest is slicing it up, I ask who made it. He is shy and answers reluctantly that his mother made it. I wake up crying, thinking that the eldest brother represented me. Later that day, I realize that it was the lasagna that represented me. <laughs> when my performances are documented, I often ask the photographer to sneak around the back and take some photographs from behind. After returning home, I take these rear view images into Photoshop. And with the use of levels adjustment, I bring to the fore the faces of the audience who thought themselves hidden in the dark. I can see who's laughing and who's not. <laughs> I have often been disappointed to find that people who I considered to be friends were not laughing. <laughs> and even worse, that some are even scowling. So, I get a call. It's not a call. It's an email that leads to a phone call. Someone wants to collect my live art, to harvest it like rubber from a tree. A posh, lisping woman tells me that she wants me to perform at a collector's house before they have supper. I wonder, did they call me or the caterers first? I go by taxi cab, which drops me off by two ivy-covered gateposts, a big house with all the lights on. In the garden, a tree with the remnants of a treehouse clinging onto it, evidence of children long grown up 
and off to college or uni. I want it. A woman with a perfect bobbed haircut answers the door, and with that, a backdraft of expensive cooking smell. Expensive food smells often teeter on the fowl. I enter the room. Everyone is whispering in the high camp of the moment. Standing and sitting, an assortment of middle-aged curios. All obviously attractive ones, save for one pale little piggy with dropsy. <laughs> the others are sweetly scented and wear big, bold jewelry to distract from the wrinkles and sags. I ask to go to the toilet, which resembles a pharaoh's wet room. <laughs> On the wall, there is a black and white photograph of the owner of the house, apparently big game hunting on safari with a pith helmet and rifle. When I look closer, I realize that it's not a tiger that he has his foot on, but an artist I sort of recognize from somewhere <laughs> with small Gandhi-style spectacles and a preppy haircut. In the hallway, I notice a laptop covered in stickers. Who is the cock putting stickers on his laptop? <laughs> I think to myself. Back in the room, they are ready for me. One man is faithfully dressed like an off-duty soldier in the Napoleonic Wars, with a thick red stripe down the side of his baggy trousers an enormous beard like a horse's nose bag. I wonder how far this dude's historic bent goes. Does he squat and strain over a vintage china potty after being out clubbing all night? <laughs> His partner has a fondant face with countersunk eyes, and she has a handbag in the shape of a very realistic tortoise. I imagine her buying the novelty bag and saying, oh, this is fun. Look, darling, it, it's like a tortoise that's also a bag. <laughs> her husband replies with a whisper in her ear, oh, yes, darling, that's magical. <laughs> that is truly magical. <laughs> Sitting on the sofa, a man with a livid face, boiling. A light-colored linen suit tends to his burns. His shoes are hybrid Persian slipper running shoe. He is cleaning some muck from under his fingernails with an oyster card. <laughs> Sitting on the arm of the chair, a woman with an amulet around her neck. It's time for my performance, and here comes the stooping PA with a bob rounding people up. A lifetime of tending to other people's whims has left its mark on her. In fact, it's left her question mark shaped. I perform, and I can't tell you what that feels like. It lasts for about 20 minutes. The performance ends. A wealthy person's belly rumbles, but is soon drowned out by a mini round of applause. I exit the lounge and somehow I make for the kitchen. A huge extractor fan for such a small kitchen. A sperm whale could fart into it and you'd smell nothing much. I take off my costume, embarrassing in a kitchen. Olive oils compete for authenticity on the counter, backs to the wall. Some slow gin on the shelf, rice cakes, tahini, a picture of some pricks in Machu Picchu. <laughs> the kickboard under the kitchen unit has fallen forward. I get down on my knees and look into the void. There is a paper plate folded in half, 
and a party popper popped. I imagine rolling under these people's units and living there for a few weeks. These clowns would probably pay me to do it <laughs> if I pitched it right. I re-enter the lounge after a thundering wee into their posh shanks. They've been talking about me. The PA with a bob crookeds over and whispers something about a taxi. I notice a wisp of caramel on her top lip. Eccentric in chief walks over, his daft shoes coming into their own now. He shakes my hand with a grip that shifts muscle from bone. At the best of times, it's hard to know what these people are thinking, but with his bonkers spectacles, this dude is indecipherable. I get into the taxi. Inside, there is a 50-50 melange of hot hi-fi and candy floss. The driver is talking into two different mobile phones. The conversation is boring, and I don't even know what he's saying. I pay him 50 pa 15 pounds and ask him for a receipt for 20. Have a good weekend. Yeah.